namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Asmad Padre Swatanayan Maya Vyapaditan Api Manu Socha Jata Sarva Swakritam Vindate Vasha Hasmad Bhadre Swatanayan Maya Vya Padithan Api Manu Socha Yatha Sarva Swakritam Vindate Vasha Hasmad Bhadre Swatanayan Maya Vyapaditan Api Manu Socha Yatha Sarva Swakritam Vindate Vashaha Hasmad Bhadre Swatanayan Maya Vyapaditan Api Manu Socha Yatha Sarva Swakritam Vindate Vashaha My dear sister, all auspiciousness unto you, Swatanayan, 
for your own sons, for your own sons. Maya, Maya by me, me. Vyapaditan unfortunately killed Abhi although Ma Anusocha do not be aggrieved Jata because Sarva everyone Swakritam the fruitive results of one's own deeds Vindate suffers or enjoys Avasha under the control of Providence. <coughs> My dear sister Devaki, all good fortune unto you. Everyone suffers and enjoys the results of his own work under the control of providence. Therefore, although your sons have unfortunately been killed by me, please do not lament for them. Purport by His Divine Grace. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. As stated in Brahma Samhita 554, Yas Twindra Gopa Matavendra Mahosva Karma Bandana Rupa Palabhajana Matanoti Karmani Nirda Hati Kindu Chabakti Bhajam Govinda Madi Purusham Tamaham Bhajami. Everyone, beginning from the small insect known as Indra Gopa up to Indra, the king of the heavenly planets, is obliged to undergo the results of his fruitive activities we may superficially see that one is suffering or enjoying because of some external causes. But the real cause is one's own fruitive activities. Even when someone kills someone else, it is to be understood that the person who was killed met the fruitive results of his own work and that the man who killed him acted as the agent of material nature. Thus Kamsa begged Devaki's pardon by analyzing the matter deeply. He was not the cause of the death of Devaki's son. Rather, this was their own destiny. Under the circumstances, Devaki should excuse Kamsa and forget his past deeds without lamentation. Kamsa admitted his own fault, but whatever he had done was under the control of providence. Kamsa might have been the immediate cause for the death of Devaki's son, but the remote cause was their past deeds. This was an actual fact. <coughs> Om Ajnantimidandasya Jnananjana Chalakaya Chakshurun Vilitam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manokstam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadati Shwa Padantikam Bandeham Sri Guru Sri Jutha Padakamalam <coughs> Sri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagrajatham Sahagana Raghunathan Bitam 
Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sapadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahakana Lalita Sri Vishakan Bitamscha Ayam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Aschatyate Satarine He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindabhaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Bansha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patithanam Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavedyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasati Gaura Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare With much gratitude, we welcome His Holiness Jayadoita Swami Maharaj to Radhakrishna. <clears throat> much louder, please. <clears throat> Hare Krishna. Today we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam. Canto 10, Chapter 4, entitled The Atrocities of King Kamsa, Text 21. <clears throat> this verse, like so many, the Srimad Bhagavatam, has many layers of perceptions to learn from. Srimad Bhagavatam <coughs> is the literary incarnation of Krishna. When Krishna left this world, he descended in the form of the Srimad Bhagavatam to give light in the darkness of this age of Kali. And as in Krishna's Leela, he could perform so many purposes through any particular action or word. Similarly, the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam can enlighten and illuminate our hearts on so many different levels of truth if we are receptive to hear. Parikshit Maharaj, he was the example of how to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Not for the purpose of getting some pious credits not for the purpose of socially being seen as attending the class. He was coming to Shukadev Goswami with a sense of the deepest urgency. He was starving for this knowledge. We cannot digest food without hunger. And similarly, 
according to how we are very eager, according to how we see that this knowledge is essential to our life. We cannot really digest it and understand it. Parikshit Maharaj was cursed to die in seven days. He was holding on to every single syllable of every word with the desire to learn, with the desire to connect to Krishna. Srila Prabhupada told us he knew for sure he had seven days. But there is not a person in this world who knows that they have seven minutes to live. That is the consciousness that is suitable to understand the Srimad Bhagavatam. Because real understanding is not simply intellectual. Jnana Vijnana Triptatma. The real joy of hearing is when there is realization. Realization does not come by our intellectual capacity or by our pious activities, even by our austerities. Realization only comes by the grace of Krishna. <coughs> Shushusho Shadadana Sya Basu Deva Kataruchi Syan Mahat Sevaya Vipra Pundyatiritada Sevanat. In the Srimad Bhagavatam text itself, it tells us to actually get a real taste for hearing. One must have this attitude of sincerely serving great souls. Sarinbatam Sukata Krishna Pundasravana Kirti. When Krishna sees that we actually have adopted this type of eagerness to hear, then by his grace he reveals the truths of the Srimad Bhagavatam and cleanses our hearts and actually gives us realization. Realization is a gift of Krishna attained to our sincerity. Srila Prabhupada writes that pure devotional service is very rare. Why? Because pure devotional service is so powerful that Krishna becomes subordinate to that pure devotion of his devotee. So he does not give it easy. But then Srila Prabhupada explains, for one who is sincere, serious, and is without ulterior motives, Krishna easily gives pure devotional service. <clears throat> this is important. Pure devotional service cannot be gotten it can only be given by Krishna. Sam Siddhir Haritoshanam, when Krishna is pleased with us. Srila Prabhupada, in his purports, has taken the essence of the realizations of all the great acharyas in history, of the various Vaishnav sampradayas, along with his own ecstatic love, and has given us the Bhaktivedanta purports accordingly. In this verse, <coughs> 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 
we find an extraordinary setting. Kamsa has imprisoned his own sister and brother-in-law, putting him in shackles out of fear of his own life because he heard the voice that the eighth son would kill him. So much attached to his own enjoyment, proprietorship, and control in this world, he was under the illusion that he could control a destiny that was beyond himself. He mercilessly murdered six infant babies brutally, directly in front of the eyes of Devaki and Vasudev. We know when a loving and caring mother and father carry a child, the mother carries the child in the womb for so many months. They're so eager. It's perhaps the ultimate happiness on a material level for family life when the baby is actually born. The mother is thrilled to see this infant child. And naturally, emotionally, biologically, there's just intense affection for that child. The first glance at the child that has been given to you. Can you imagine six consecutive times at the moment of birth, your own brother coming and viciously smashing that child against a rock in front of your own eyes? <coughs> Kamsa was not thinking about Devaki's feelings, the baby's feelings, he was not even thinking of his own karma. He was only thinking about his own egoistic desire to control and enjoy this world. Absolutely blind. This is the nature of material desires. It can infatuate and blind us so we totally blinded from our own self-interest. After keeping them in a prison, chained for so many years, and killing their children, Krishna was born at midnight. We know the story. And he informed Vasudev to exchange him with the daughter of Yashoda. Vasudev brought back Yoga Maya. She was in the form of a very tiny newborn infant baby girl. By her own potency, in order to enact this Leela for Krishna, she put everyone to sleep, opened all the doors released all the shackles and then at the opportune moment she cried just like a baby and with that cry everybody woke up and the guards immediately went to Kamsa and Kamsa ran down took the baby by the legs Devaki was embracing that little girl, begging, crying, pleading. You've already killed all my children. This is a daughter you have nothing to fear. Allow me to at least be a mother for this child. Please, I beg you. He was so merciless. He forcibly yanked her from Devaki's hand and went to smash her against the rock. But that little baby rose into the sky and manifested the form of Durga, riding on a lion, 
Come say you are a fool. <clears throat> the child that is meant to kill you has already been born and is somewhere else. Why do you harass your brother and sister? Then she went away. Kamsa realized he's not the controller. <laughs> this was a rude awakening for him. And suddenly, under the circumstances, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of that illusion was lifted from him. And he actually understood what he had done to his sister. And ultimately, he did it all for nothing. Because <laughs> he did it all. He killed all those little babies and tortured his brother-in-law and sister just to protect himself, ultimately, from the eighth child. And after doing all that, the eighth child was born and was somewhere else. It was all useless. He was humbled a little. <laughs> and he bowed down to Devaki and Vasudev and begged forgiveness, kind of. <laughs> this is how he's begging forgiveness in this particular verse. He's preaching excellent philosophy. What he's saying is Vedic philosophy, the laws of karma. Interestingly, some of the greatest asuras were also the greatest philosophers. <laughs> From an intellectual perspective, there's a whole chapter in Srimad Bhagavatam practically of Hiranyakashipu speaking super excellent, precise philosophy to his relatives after Hiranyaksha was killed. He was a yogi, he was a philosopher, but unfortunately, he had miserably bad character. And Ravana was also a pundit. He performed tremendous austerities. He was Brahman. He really had philosophy intellectually, but he had miserable character. There was a conversation between his Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada and a particular lady who was working on her PhD. I believe she was from Australia. And she was asking Srila Prabhupada questions. <coughs> she, was, she was asking Srila Prabhupada about how it, how it was that Indian gurus were coming to America and what was the effect on the, on the American and European culture? And Srila Prabhupada asked, what culture are you talking about? <laughs> the cow is your mother, she's giving you milk, and then you kill the cow and drink her milk, and I mean drink her blood and eat her flesh. What is that? What kind of culture is that? And, you know, she said, well, you know, we're not of your religion. And Srila Prabhupada said, in the Bible it says, thou shalt not kill. Why are you killing? <coughs> and it went back and forth. And finally, she said, she saw she wasn't really getting what she wanted as far as her thesis. So she said to Srila Prabhupada, um, I, let us discuss your philosophy. And Srila Prabhupada's words, when I heard this tape, it was like a thunderbolt of significant teaching. Srila Prabhupada said, 
philosophy without good character has little or no meaning. So here we have Kamsa. He's preaching excellent philosophy. So first we'll discuss briefly the philosophy he's saying and then we'll discuss the character of the philosopher that's saying it. And then, if we have time, we'll discuss the reality of what's actually happening here. So the philosophy is that there are laws of nature. Just like the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. I can proudly write <clears throat> hundreds of books based on lifetime of scientific research to prove the thesis that what goes up does not come down. <laughs> but even after all these books, this is what happens. <laughs> it simply doesn't matter what I believe. Laws are laws. The law of gravity is a law of nature. And there are more subtle laws of nature called karma. That for every action there's an equal corresponding reaction. In the Bible, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. What goes around comes around. This is a law. It doesn't matter what we believe. Srila <coughs> Prabhupada said, it, whether you believe fire burns or not, when you put your hand in fire, it will burn. Whether you understand it or not. Whether the chief fire marshal puts his hand in fire or a newborn baby puts his hand in fire. It's going to have the same effect. because that's the law of nature. The lower species of life are living out their karma. They do not produce karma because they do not have the development of free will. But the human being has been blessed with free will. Oftentimes the soul must evolve through 8,400,000 species to reach the human birth, which is the crescendo of creation. Because we are given this free will to choose. But with that free will comes an enormous responsibility. We are answerable to our every action and our every word. You can't get away with anything. The laws of the state, if you're, in, if you're clever enough or you have enough money or you know the right people, you can get away with crimes. But the laws of nature, there's no escape. Paramatma, the Lord within the heart, sees every action, hears every word. And the devatas who are responsible for how this material creation is existing, they have their network where they know everything. And Maya Devi herself is all powerful. She's the expansion of Krishna. Therefore, we cannot 
get away with anything. Both our spiritual advancement as well as our material karmic situation is dependent upon what Krishna sees. Not what, what people with mortal eyes see. It's scary and it's wonderful. Scary for Kamsa because he was addicted to so many sinful acts. Why didn't he apply this philosophy to himself? That we'll get to in a few minutes. But the laws of karma are for everyone who is conditioned within this material existence. Srila <clears throat> Prabhupada told our Peter Burwash in every lecture he gives to devotees, he always repeats this as foundational to what he says. Where he actually gave a donation and then some, the person he gave the donation to ran away with all the money and didn't use it for its purpose. And he complained to Prabhupada in a nice way. And Prabhupada said, do not blame the instrument of your own karma. This is the way a devotee sees things. Tatenu kampam susamikshamano bunjana evatmikritam vipagam. That whatever comes upon us, instead of blaming other people, we understand this is my destiny. Due to what I have done in the past, this is just coming back to me. <clears throat> and this consciousness frees us from making excuses to perpetuate and aggravate our karmic situation. <clears throat> because you see, whatever may come to us now is due to our past. We really don't have much choice what's going to happen to us. But we do have a choice how we're going to respond to it. We could respond by blaming something or someone for what's happening and retaliate. And then just aggravate and perpetuate the cycle of karma we're in and make things worse. Or we could behave in a compassionate and a proper way. And then out of that bad karma, it's erased because we've gone through it and we've sowed good karma for the future. Or we could surrender to Krishna. Tate nukam pam susamik shibano, bunjana ivat mikritam vipagam. This verse that Brahma speaks here in Srimad Bhagavatam. That when suffering comes upon a devotee, a devotee with folded hands and a grateful heart offers obeisances to Krishna. I know whatever's happening is only a small token of what I deserve. In this state, let me pass through it with tolerance and surrender to you, my Lord. And one who does that, the supreme liberation is that person's rightful claim. Because Krishna is so pleased. So Kamsa is speaking from a philosophical point of view very precisely. Srila Prabhupada in the purport is agreeing with everything Kamsa says. Yes, by the power of providence, we are responsible for our own acts. And therefore, these children who died from Kamsa, 
it, Kamsa was the instrument. He was the agent. And Devaki and Vasudev, he was the agent to make them suffer by ma seeing their children die. So Kamsa is saying, don't be mad at me. Don't lament. It's my fault. But on a higher level, it's not really my fault. It's their fault. <laughs> now we'll speak on the subject of Srila Prabhupada saying that philosophy has little or no meaning without good character because that is the purpose of philosophy is to transform one's life otherwise philosophy could be one of the most dangerous things on the face of the earth if it is being understood and pro propagated by people with low character. Because according to the laws of karma, even if it is the karma of someone to suffer, if you're the one that makes them suffer, you have to accept all the karma of making that person suffer. I remember when I was a new devotee, somebody asked a senior leader of our society, is it that, you know, all, these, all this cow slaughter in the West, is it the karma of these cows to be slaughtered and if it is what's the use of protecting cows because they're going to die anyway and I remember that devotee he quoted Srila Prabhupada he said you know what the karma of these living entities are may be something that you don't understand. But one thing you can understand, if you have any participation on any level of the killing of that cow, you are fully responsible with all the karma to suffer. The living entity in the cow's body, you may not understand fully, but this you can understand completely. You are responsible. Whether a person deserves to suffer or not, if you're the one inflicting on it, you may be an instrument in one sense, but you have the choice whether you're going to be that instrument. And if you do, then there's going to be instruments coming after you. <laughs> because you have full responsibility. And this is in many ways what turns people away from religion or spiritual life. Hypocrisy. Kali Yuga is the age of quarrel and hypocrisy. Hiranyakashipu was Satya Yuga. Kamsa was Dwapa Yuga. Ravana was Treta Yuga. They were all philosophers. And probably better intellectual philosophers than anyone today. Kamsa had all those heads and they were all filled with philosophy. <laughs> you 
Now it's the age of Kali, which is actually the age of hypocrisy. So many people in the West were brought up in homes with religions, but they just saw so much hypocrisy. And they saw so much complacency in actually applying the teachings of their religion in daily life. And when, then when they met Srila Prabhupada, they saw something extraordinary. Here was an Acharya, an Acharya who was living by these highest principles of philosophy, who was actually had the character of true love for God, which was manifested as compassion and self-control and humility. And fearlessness. And he was very specifically teaching people how to live with the character of philosophy. There was a lifestyle. And therefore, people who rejected their own religions found a person who was giving the essence of all religions and they accepted it and their lives were transformed. It's most important. Srila Prabhupada was once asked by an interviewer, how will we know who is your follower? Srila Prabhupada, he answered in different ways, but in a particular time he said, because you will see that they are perfect ladies and gentlemen. The word of a great devotee, the name of a great devotee is Narotam, which means the ultimate perfect human being. Srimad Bhagavatam explains that from the mode of goodness one can transcend to, tr to the spiritual state of life. Srila Prabhupada tells that there are 18 Puranas, six for those in the mode of ignorance to raise them to the mode of passion. Six for those in the mode of passion to raise them to the mode of goodness, and six in the mode of goodness to raise them to the transcendental plane. So our philosophical understandings, and even our sadhana, is like the airplane to take us to Vaikuntha. The mode of goodness is like the runway to get that airplane off the ground. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling, and no meeting in and of themselves are not transcendental. They're simply in the mode of goodness. Because there are atheists who, are, who don't eat meat who don't have illicit sex, who don't take intoxication, and who don't gamble. So by following those four regulative principles, it's not that they're making great spiritual advancement. They're living, to some extent, in the mode of goodness. But when we live by those four principles, and we're stable on that goodness form, then when we chant the holy names of Krishna and render devotional service and hear Srimad Bhagavatam, we just take off to the spiritual world.
we have seen on so many occasions when people mistreat others and then philosophically rationalize it to the others, to themselves, and to the world that they didn't do anything wrong. It's all karma. To misuse good philosophy with bad character is not only immensely destructive to our own spiritual lives, but it's one of the greatest challenges to the faith of a society. It's natural that people simply don't even believe in the philosophy when they see it doesn't change a person's character. Srila Prabhupada writes that the purpose of all of his temples was to bring people to the blessing of associating with devotees. It means to see that we live by our philosophy. Then people not only believe and have faith in the philosophy, but they're induced to practice it because they see its result. <clears throat> In the early days of my spiritual life within ISKCON, I lived at New Vrindavan. And it was very interesting because when I was there, Srila Prabhupada came three times and I came to practically every one of his classes and every one of his darshans and his conversations. Sometimes he was there for two weeks. And interestingly, although in the city temples, mainly Srila Prabhupada was putting tremendous emphasis on the publication and distribution of his books. We have seen so many letters, and we've heard so many tapes, and we've seen so many quotes. Srila Prabhupada told us that he personally put his own spiritual ecstasies in his purports. While everyone else was sleeping, he would be up for hours three, four hours every night translating and giving the world his purports. He put so much of his life into those books and he was speaking to you and me and to everyone. And I remember when I was in New York in 1972 after coming from India Srila Prabhupada was emphasizing to those devotees how important it was to distribute his books. But then he said, but they are not only to be distributed, they are to be read. I remember exactly, because I was just, I remember where I was standing, right? on the side of Radha Govinda Dave at the Henry Street Temple, and Prabhupada was on his Vyasa side across. And Prabhupada said, it is not that the book distributor should give a book to someone and ask them to buy it. And then they say, do you read these books? And he said, no, no, I only sell them. <laughs> he said, who will want to buy? We must read the books and we must distribute the books. 
And what does it mean to read the books? Srila Prabhupada wasn't talking about reading the books as a scholarly exercise. When Prabhupada talks about reading the books, he's talking about actually being nourished by them, following what they say, transforming our life and our character. So when Srila Prabhupada came to New Vrindavan, to be honest with you, I just don't remember where he ever talked about book distribution to us. He talked about protecting the cows and agriculture. And especially he talked about spiritual society and making it into a place of pilgrimage where people could come and see a spiritual society. He said, we distribute our books, but then people read their books. He said, they require a place to see where, these, where the teachings of these books are actually being followed. A society of Krishna consciousness. He said, this is the purpose of New Vrindavan and these communities where they come and they actually see what a society is like when they're living by the books. That combination is irresistible and it's very powerful. And interestingly, I remember Vishnu Jana Maharaj, he used to, every time he'd come, he would tell us this. He was with Radha Damodar, traveling Sankirtan. He said, we are distributing books, but then they must come to New Vrindavan and see the books in action. In a society of life, who follow, of people who follow them. And actually, I remember there's a purport of Srila Prabhupada where he says that wherever there is pure devotional service to Krishna, that is none different than Goloka Vrindavan. And he said, in West Virginia, we have our community, New Vrindavan, and it is non-different than Goloka Vrindavan, because everyone there is serving Krishna, with Krishna in the center. So I remember the devotees at New Vrindavan became quite proud. <laughs> that there are, we are non-different than Goloka. It was, it was a really very often used point to keep people from going anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> but then I saw a purport where Srila Prabhupada explains, actually it's in the same purport, it's just a little later, where he says, all of my temples, all of my temples are non different than Goloka Vrindavan. <laughs> if Krishna is in the center. So that's what Radha Gopinath Temple, Radha Ras Bihari Temple, Radha Giri Dari Temple, all the hundreds of temples of Srila Prabhupada throughout the world are meant to be. Places where people can get the association of those who are actually living like Vaishnavas. Not like Kamsas with Tilak. <laughs> it's very important. What is a Vaishnav? The Srimad Bhagavatam teaches us Vaishnav behavior. The postgraduate study of Srimad Bhagavatam is Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, where we see the interactions and love between Vaishnavas. There is no false ego. 
I am the proprietor, I am the controller, and I am the enjoyer. There is no envy. Where someone has more or does more and we want to tear them down because we want. And envy is so subtle. And ego is so subtle. And greed is so subtle. It could be utterly gross or meticulously subtle. So subtle that we can take our philosophy to justify it. We could take the pure philosophy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srimad Bhagavatam and use it as a weapon to serve the interests of our ego, our envy, our greed, our lust, our illusion, our anger. And unfortunately, that is a propensity. The ahankar, the false ego, wants to be in a very elevated position. Doesn't want to admit faults. Therefore, the false ego can take the philosophy that is meant to destroy the false ego and use it to defend like a weapon the false ego birth after birth after birth after birth and after birth. Sri Chaitanya Bhagavat, Lord Chaitanya says that if someone chants the holy names but is envious and criticizes others, then myself in my name will destroy that person. That's why every day in our temples we recite the ten offenses before we chant the holy names. We shouldn't just recite. We should hear what we're reciting and understand it and analyze our own life. Are we really following? In one sense, this is what Srila Prabhupada means when he says we should be sincere. You have to be kind of humble. You have to be quite humble to actually be sincere. Because we actually have to apply the teachings in a proper way and not misuse them. Because we know, we know the nature of the mind. The mind could be the best friend or the worst enemy, depending on whether we control it or let it control us. And that uncontrolled mind will use anything, including our philosophy to justify. We twist it, we modify it as the highest, and, and we, we believe or exclaim that it's the highest truth. What a graphic example here in Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's there. Kamsa speaking perfect Vedic philosophy to justify the atrocious acts that he had done and take the blame away from himself.
That tendency is in all of us. To actually understand the philosophy means transformation of our lives. Our words, our actions, our interactions with other people. And that is what is critical. Because at the time of death, how many slokas we know and how well we can propound the philosophy is not going to determine where we go. It's going to be our consciousness. What actually is our values? What is our character? And ultimately, how much have we actually pleased Krishna and developed love for Krishna? That's all that really matters. And that's all that ever really matters. But the ego deludes us to think that other things are important. It's all that matters. Yes, we want to distribute hundreds of millions of billions of trillions of Srila Prabhupada's books. But for Krishna consciousness to really have a powerful foundation to transform the world, the devotees, we have to have a society that lives by these books, that has the character of true Vaishnavas. Srimad Bhagavatam, in many ways, so many of the stories are more about the devotee than Krishna. <clears throat> because this is how Krishna is glorified. Through the Krishna is glorified and Krishna is accessible through the life and words of the devotees. Prahlad was in a very difficult situation, as was Dhruva, as was Ambarish, as was the Pandavas, as was Ranti Dev, as were the Brijavasis again and again. Srimad Bhagavatam has stories of devotees, even in very, very testing situations, their Vaishnav character. They're taking shelter of Krishna and maintaining the integrity of true devotees. Anybody can be a true devotee when everything is going just the way you like it. People like you, people appreciate you, you're successful, you're healthy, you're sec everything you do is excellent and appreciated. But when things are not going at all the way you want, that's the test of how much we've actually understood our philosophy. Are we able to put into practice, like Ambarish, like Dhruva, like Prahlad, like the Brijabhasis when every day demons were coming? In every situation of Srimad Bhagavatam, these souls, they turned to Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in many ways, he summed it all up. Trinada pi suniche na taror iba sehishnana. Amani namana dena kirtaniya sadahari. Be humble like a blade of grass, more humble than a blade of grass more tolerant than a tree, offering all respect to others and accepting none in return. It is that disposition, that attitude, that pleases Krishna. 
then Krishna manifests himself in his name. And we taste that sweet nectar and we could chant the holy names. Of course, from another level, Kamsa was not simply an instrument of karma. He was a puppet in the hands of Krishna. It was Krishna's leela to appear in the world in this way. It was his will and Krishna orchestrated it and he chose just the right people to play the right parts. <laughs> Kamsa was a demon. It's not that he descended from the spiritual world or anything. <laughs> he was Kaladami, he was a demon. But Krishna selected Kamsa very appropriately to be the person who was going to very much teach the world the greatest lessons of what not to do <laughs> and not what not to be and the attitude of misusing philosophy and misusing yoga to exploit the ego but ultimately it was Krishna's pastime Srimad Bhagavatam Indra's a great devotee, but somehow or other Krishna really likes to utilize him to teach the world what not to do. But still, we read in Sri in Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, which is given to us by our beloved dear God brother Gopi Puranadana Prabhu, and His Holiness Jayadvaita Swami Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada wanted this book, Srihad Bhagavatam Rita, which is like a summary of Srimad Bhagavatam by Srila Sanatana Goswami. Prabhupada wanted it for his devotees and for the world. These devotees worked years to, to in such a pure, faithful way to Srila Prabhupada's methodology and his spirit to bring that book to us. And for that, to our beloved God, Brother Gopi Puranadana Prabhu, and all of his character, he's a person who was a profound scholar of Sanskrit, a person who very much mastered our philosophy and other philosophies as well, because he studied the different commentaries. But what was his character? So many people who learned Sanskrit under Srila Prabhupada became quite proud. Janmaishwarya Shruti Shribir Edamana Madapuman. Kunti says there are four prominent disqualifications to become Krishna conscious. A lot of beauty, wealth, high birth, and knowledge. <clears throat> because the tendency is they make us proud. And in that proud state, we can't actually feelingly cry out Krishna's names or really be in the spirit of the servant of the servant of the servant. So yes, there were some people who became very, very, not very, very, but they became quite adept at Sanskrit. And they could go beyond to read all sorts of other literatures. And they become proud. And due to that pride, they thought they were better than others who didn't know the Sanskrit. And as soon as you start thinking that way about devotees, I'm better than the other devotees, 
because of what I know or what I can do. And Krishna becomes displeased and he withdraws his mercy and then you could even start thinking, I know better than my guru. I know better than Prabhupada. So most all of them fell away because of that false ego. But here was Gopi Paranadana Prabhu who consistently studied and learned and had a and had a deeper understanding eventually than all the others. But always humble, always faithful, always loyal, always grateful. He understood that whatever I am and whatever I know is by Prabhupada's mercy. And therefore, in every purport, in every tikka or commentary of every acharya, from the core of his heart, Krishna was revealing the greatness of Srila Prabhupada's presentation and the enthusiasm to share Srila Prabhupada's mercy with the world. Rupa and Sanatan Goswami in the, in the um, Bhakti Ratnakar said that <coughs> Srinivas Acharya's father, Chaitanya Das, he was telling Srinivas that many years ago I went to Ramakali with my guru and I saw Rupa and Sanatan. At that time their name was Sakar Malik and Dabir Kas. They were in an assembly of the greatest scholars of the land. And among them, they were the greatest scholars. They had incredible wealth, inconceivable power. They were beautiful, like Cupid. They looked like Indra in a court. And yet, they offered all honor and respect and humble service to everyone. This combination of having opulences and being humble. Aishwaryasya, Samagrasya, Viryasya, Yashashashriya, Jnana Vairagya Yashchaiva. Bhagavan is one who possesses six opulences beauty, knowledge, wealth, strength, fame, and detachment. Ultimately, detachment means detachment from the false ego. Every other detachment is only for the purpose of detaching ourselves from the false ego. If we're proud, all our other so called renunciation has missed its purpose. Because at the time of death, Krishna is not really concerned with how many cars you have or whether you sleep under a tree. Krishna is concerned with how you can act, how you've actually humbled yourself to cry out his holy name and to love him and to serve him. So the six Goswamis, particularly Rupa and Sanatan, Raghunath, they had everything material. But still they were humble like blades of grass. That combination is so irresistible and attractive. And we are meant to follow in the footsteps of the six Goswamis. So Gopi Paranadana Prabhu, he had incredible knowledge, but eager to be the servant of the servant of the servant. Always so simple, very humble, very pure, not inclined to finding faults with others non-envious. And it is such a loss to the world without him. It can't be calculated. But Krishna has his plan. 
He departed at Govardhan. Srila Prabhupada took him where ultimately he wants him. So we have these living examples. And we need these living examples in order to really go deeply into imbibing the spirit of our philosophy. Jivara Swarupoy Krishnera Nityadas. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu expounded such profound philosophy from the basic principles to the highest realms of rasa tattva to Sanatana Goswami. But as a foundation, he built it all, all on this simple principle that the soul is eternally the servant of Krishna. And not only that, but he presented it to Sanatana Goswami after Sanatan Goswami presented himself as being the most fallen, the most unqualified. I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm suffering. I don't know why I'm here. People call me a pundit, but I don't even know who I am. Therefore, I'm a hypocrite. He was begging, please instruct me. That was the mood of Pariksit. That was the mood of Arjuna when the Gita began. Because without that character, we can't really understand philosophy. We could memorize. We can speak. But many people who memorize and speak fall away. Along with distributing our books and doing Harinam Sankirtan and all of our preaching, we should understand that the foundational basis is practice, taking responsibility, creating a society of devotees. Not a society of people who just say they're Krishna conscious, but a society who are actually interacting with each other, interacting with the world, and interacting with Krishna according to Srila Prabhupada's teachings. then not only the books are there, but we give people shelter. Srila Prabhupada said sometimes that anyone who thinks they could be Krishna conscious without the association of devotees is an illusion. So we need that association. But we want to create an association that will uplift our faith in our enthusiasm and inspire us to go deeper into the qualities of Vaishnavism. When we distribute a book, when we speak about Krishna, the, I, the attitude is not, I'm better than you, and I have something I want to give you. Prabhupada gave us the attitude that as your servant, I'm giving you this book, I'm speaking Krishna consciousness to purify myself. And to also be an instrument of Prabhupada's compassion to purify you. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Krishna. It's about Srila Prabhupada. We're simply meant to be instruments. Recognizing and meditating on where the power is coming from. Otherwise, Punar Mushtakabhava. Srila Prabhupada has made little, little mundane mouses into spiritual lions. 
But if we, if we think it is about me, I am saving the world, then eventually again become a mouse. Srila Prabhupada prayed to be a puppet on the Jala Tutta. Our prayer is to be the puppet of the puppet of the puppet. <laughs> That's the safe position. Thank you very much. Srila Jaya Doita Swami Maharaj, would you like to enlighten us with some words? In one sentence, he can say more than I can say in ten lifetimes. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Huh? Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Oh. <laughs> See, he's showing this quality of gratitude toward Srila Prabhupada, even speaking through anyone. That is the realization. Sir. One or two questions or comments? <coughs> yes. Maharaj, you were mentioning Kamsa was so much uh, having material desires and sense gratification and is entangling himself. After hearing it also, and there is a strong desire to enjoy and there are so many objects of senses around and uh, the, after hearing, we remember while doing sense gratification, it is bad. You hear the instructions, shlokas, everything is there. But when the objects comes, it is very difficult. From the heart, the desire to enjoy is not going. How to give up that desire? Hare Krishna. It begins with the attitude you are exhibiting at this moment that you really want to. You don't want to just practice the external, the external forms of devotion without actually gaining realization and transformation. Which really means we want to please Prabhupada and please Krishna. So if we just practice the principles of devotional service, following these regulative principles, actually trying to understand and study Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, rendering service without a fruitive desire, that means we render service na dhanam na janam na sundarim kavitam bhajaka disha kamaye mama janmani janmani shwari bhavata bhakti rohai tiki tvai We're not doing it to get nice partner for sex. We're not doing it for money or wealth. We're not doing it for prestige or fame or followers. We're not even doing it for liberation from suffering. We're doing it to serve Krishna. Now obviously the mind has so many desires. Let them come and go. But we should fix our consciousness on this root aspiration of a Vaishnava. To please Krishna. Pure devotional service. Vritrasura, he was also a demon in Srimad Bhagavatam, but he was a different kind of demon. He was a Paramahamsa demon. <laughs> he spoke the philosophy, but he really deeply lived it in a very extraordinary way, according to Krishna's will. So it's important that we should have the right goal and attitude and we keep that always in the forefront 
when we're doing our chanting, when we're doing our studies, when we're doing our seva. Keep the goal in heart. That is sincerity. And try to live by this spirit. And then by Krishna's grace, when Krishna sees we're actually sincere, when we're actually endeavoring with, with our capacity, Maya is so strong. But if we just take shelter of Krishna sincerely by practicing these principles of bhakti, then Krishna will uplift us. Krishna will restore our original prema bhakti. Does that answer your question? Hari Hari. One more question because I went over time. I guess we should have Sri Dhamma because he really looks enthusiastic to ask this <laughs> one. Everybody else is like this, but he's <laughs> Maharaj, thank you for your uh, very amazing class, very characteristic class about character. Uh, what I wanted to really ask Maharaj is that I was realizing that uh, we have many forums where we can study Srila Prabhupada's books in a very systematic way like the Bhakti Shastri and other, other forums. We have the Vidya Peetam in Vrindavan, Govardhan. But uh, since we know that the most important aspect of reading Prabhupada's books is the character, as you mentioned so wonderfully in your class, uh, what forum do we have? Or rather, what can we do to really develop this aspect? Because it is easy to read the books, but it is just a big challenge to really get the character. And without character, is the whole thing is a, is a jury void, is just zero. So how do we really get this character in us and the people that uh, that are coming to Krishna consciousness so that the society becomes a society of devotees with character By, Prabhupada, by Srila Prabhupada's own design, <clears throat> the association of devotees within our society is meant to stimulate that. In our temples every morning we have Srimad Bhagavatam class. And in many places every evening Bhagavad Gita class. We have Mangalarti, Guru Puja, we have our Japa, where we're nourishing ourselves with Krishna's grace. And through the day we have the association of devotees, where we're actually supposed to be helping each other to develop that character, helping each other to actually remember our philosophy and live by our philosophy. That's what real association is about. Real association of devotees is not about coming together with people with tilaks and dhotis and gossiping, talking about mundane subjects or finding faults with others or wasting time. Actual association of devotees is when we're, <coughs> we're centering this precious, rare opportunity to be with devotees to go deep into the Srimad Bhagavatam through our life, through our values, through our surrender. That's what we're supposed to be doing. 
We can go and get Bhakti Shastri, we can get Bhakti Vaibhava. That gives us knowledge, which is tremendous. Prabhupada wanted that. But it's going to be realized when we have a society of devotees who are really friends with each other. <laughs> friends of the soul. Helping each other to actually understand, realize, and live it. Helping each other to overcome our weaknesses and our illusions. That's a society of devotees, and nothing can replace that. And, each, and that can only happen when each and every one of us, whether we're new devotees or senior devotees, we make spiritual advancement, Prabhupada says, when we take responsibility. That doesn't only mean responsibility in the chores that we're giving in devotional service. That's part of it. But it means taking responsibility to actually help each other to become Vaishnavas. Help each other to go deeper into the philosophy. Help each other to always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. Not like Kamsa. Kamsa always remembered Krishna and never forgot Krishna. <laughs> now he got liberated. But if we are if we remember Krishna like that, we're not going to get liberated. To always remember Krishna and to never forget Krishna as the servant of the servant of Krishna. Yes? So we each and every one of us to take responsibility to be an ins Prabhupada's instrument to enlighten each other. Much chata matkata prana bodhiyanta paras. Bhagavad Gita explains my devotees gather together and discuss my topics. They're surrendered to me. <clears throat> so having these degrees is a wonderful facility. It helps us to become absorbed in Krishna. It also helps us to philosophically understand and be able to discriminate within this world. But the realization is going to come when we take what we've heard and we're instruments of that knowledge that Srila Prabhupada has given us to enlighten and inspire each other. That is critical. It's not that we should be waiting for everyone else to do it. We don't make much advancement when we wait for everyone else to do it. It's easy to see where, where people are not doing it and criticize. Srila Prabhupada didn't take this very seriously when devotees criticized each other. Prabhupada would say, you do it. That's serious. Not criticizing others because they're not doing it, but you do it. You be it. And the more each of us takes that attitude, let me be an instrument to inspire people in the real values of Srila Prabhupada's teachings. Then there's going to be a great society of real Krishna consciousness that can not only protect the devotees but could attract the world. His Holiness Jayadvaita Maharaj can I think you might remember this, but I remember at one time I was told that Srila Prabhupada was with the leaders of his society and he said, if the people in this room were actually following my teachings, we, can t we could make the world Krishna conscious in 18 days. I was told that just a few days after it happened by somebody who was in the room. Prabhupada said, better one moon than many stars. To 
tonight's lunar eclipse. <laughs> we should not be eclipsed. Well, Prabhupada wanted a whole st sky full of moons. That means actually taking responsibility to help each other, to remember Krishna in this favorable Krishna conscious way, to help each other overcome their challenges and their problems with faith, with integrity, and with actual devotion, which essentially means without false ego. That's the hard core root of all our diseases is the false ego. It causes lust, it causes envy, it causes anger and greed and illusion. The purpose of our whole philosophy is to remove the false ego that I'm the enjoyer, I'm the controller, I'm the proprietor. And awaken the real ego that I'm the eternal servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna. So yes, we can create the Vaikuntha atmosphere. Srila Prabhupada said the Vaikuntha atmosphere is where every devotee is thinking everyone else is better than me, I am the servant. That's Vaikuntha atmosphere. And Goloka atmosphere is that and beyond. Through that consciousness, Sri Sri Radha Gopinath charms, attracts, and captures our hearts. So it is important that individually and collectively we take this responsibility. This is our most crucial service to Srila Prabhupada. When Prabhupada was asked, how can we repay you for what we have given you, for what you have given us? Srila Prabhupada said, you accept what I have given and then you share it with others. It begins with sharing it with devotees and then sharing it with the whole world. But what does it mean to accept it? It means the substance of what is in Srila Prabhupada's books. The character of a Vaishnava. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you so much. So we will end here. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah.